It's not unlike what what was happening in the Republican Party before Trump, where you had like what's happening now with the Dems. You had this elitist, more establishment group of, you know, Mitt, with all due respect to Mitt Romney, Mitt Romney types um, who were, you know, sort of seemed perfect on paper to become president or, you know, be a leader, but really were not connecting with the masses, you know, with the Republican working class, the Democrat working class, couldn't get those Reagan Democrats back into the fold. Um, and then we had Trump come come on the scene and just completely blow everything up. And he did connect with them. And that's how he won. And now it's like the Democrats are this, the party of the elite, you know, the Harvard educated, we know better than you. And they don't seem all that worried like they used to be about how people are doing in the unions and whether they're earning, you know, a real livable wage and listening to their real complaints as opposed to being like, shut up and vote Democrat. That's what's good for you. Well, there are real structural reasons as to why this has happened, right? There is no party in America that is truly um, invested in the welfare and growth and strength of unions the way there used to be. Union rights were decimated over the course of the 70s and 80s by Republican administrations. And third way, neoliberal Democrats didn't do much to step in and save them in the 90s and 2000s. And so now one of the most powerful groups that could stand in defense of workers no longer has the political traction that it used to. At the same time, um, rules around the influence of money and politics have been corrupted to the extent to which the uh, polls show, a Princeton study from a few years ago showed that there is almost no relationship, none, between the preferences of American voters and politicians because the predominant preferences that are um, you know, tr- tr- expressed, that get through to politicians, are those from lobbyists and special interest groups. Mm-hmm. And that's not, a, that's not helping anybody um, of any political party or affiliation. Yes. This is why it's funny, because I feel like people on sort of the Bernie Sanders team, you know, whether it's you or Crystal Ball or um, I just a big collection are kind of meeting the more working class Republicans and the Republican Party itself is becoming the party of the working class in in a strange place. Right. Like strange bedfellows uh, are being formed here because it seems like now the Democrat Party has become the party of elite that doesn't really care about the Democrats love unions. They love the union bosses. They they don't care about the, the actual workers. Otherwise, they'd be handling it a lot differently. Well, I think I would be really clear about this. Republicans are winning no awards here. It's a it's a race to the bottom. And, well, the, and the Republicans hate unions altogether. <laughs> right, right, exactly. So we, you know, it is important that at least under Joe Biden, you have, a, you know, an LRB that's willing to enforce labor laws, for instance. It matters in the labor disputes and the wave of strikes that we've seen across the country. It matters that Amazon is getting a review of uh, or the Amazon um, workers, rather, are getting a review of whether or not their union efforts were unfairly tampered with by the corporation. You know, those kind of things matter. And that's why it matters to have, you know, Democrats in office as opposed to Republicans. But I don't identify as a Democrat. And part of the reason why is because, you know, better than the other guy isn't serving the people the way it should be. And the reality is, you know, I had a recent episode with Batia Ungar Sargan, who has written this really interesting book about how, you know, media, the the way that media is covering um, working class issues has really uh, affected the way that uh, populations see themselves reflected in in politicians. And she has a really interesting and important account about how the, the failure of kind of populist media has resulted in what we have today. But one thing that her studies and her charts in her book reveal is that there is an incredibly elite readership on the right as well. Um, papers like The Economist and, and The Washington Journal have elite audience as well. And while they might have um, throw, you know, bow into identity politics every now and then, when it comes to core economic and financial commitments, they always align with the 1%. So what we have is two parties that talk about identity, that have these culture wars in order to distract from the extent to which both parties, leadership in both parties are ignoring the needs of the worker. Majorities of, of Republicans want a, a $15 minimum wage or higher. You know, Florida voted for a $15 minimum wage at the same time it voted for Donald Trump to be president by 60 percent. 60 percent of Florida voted for the $15 minimum wage. And as upset as I am that Joe Biden hasn't fought for it, I'm infinitely more disappointed in Republicans who are categorically ignoring what their base wants as well. Mm. I mean, we, I, I am with you on the the need to take a hard look at why people who are working very hard cannot get ahead in this country anymore. The the diminishing American dream is a real thing. And we need to be honest about that and how systems need to change. Why do we have these like 
oligarchs like Jeff Bezos now, right? Like these these people at the top of these massive companies who are just swimming in billions of wealth while their workers are toiling away making crap. I mean, they have no lives. They can't see their families. They don't have good vacations. They don't understand why they have to sacrifice yet another day of, with their kids so that Jeff Bezos can have yet another home. I get that. I totally get that. But I also think... I can argue with you about the minimum wage because I think that that leads to the destruction of jobs. I mean, we've seen it happen time after time where companies, especially with these inflation rates, say, I can't do that. Like, I'm not my margins aren't good enough and I'm I'm not going to be able to make it back. And then I'm just going to have to eliminate positions like I can pay my two people fifteen dollars an hour, but I could have had ten at ten or nine dollars an hour. Well, when you look at how much money has been earned by our extremely productive workforce, remember, Americans have only gotten more productive over time. Over mm-hmm. the last 30 or 40 years, enormous, an enormous percentage, the overwhelming majority of profits from that productivity have gone to the 1%. Yes. So this isn't an issue to your, to your point about there not being enough money to go around. It, the issue is that uh, CEOs, corporatists, have been able to keep more profits, steal more profits from their workers who are really doing the labor. Well, than no, they I agree with you. Like, I, when I look at Jeff Bezos, I, I want him to pay as much as humanly possible to every Amazon where, you know, when I see these big corporations. But when it's a smaller business, I just think, you know, they're, you can't hit them with those kinds of minimums because their margins are too, just too small. Like, the workers will wind up paying. Well, here's some, here's some other, you know, this is an interesting conversation because oftentimes these progressive issues are framed as being anti-worker and anti-small business. When the reality is, for instance, having Medicare for all, uh, not making small business owners pay the medical costs for their insurer- insurers would be the single biggest boon to small business owners in the his- it, it, that, that exists. Right. The single biggest cost for small business owners is providing health insurance for their employees. And if instead of having to have employers take it out of people's paychecks, and then have Americans paying twice as much that, uh, compared to any other civil, similarly industrialized country for worse outcomes medically than other in- industrialized countries. We simply paid half as much as we're paying to health insurance in taxes for a program that is as well run and as admired as Medicare, i.e. Medicare for all. And that's mm-hmm. an enormous business savings. And to your point about um, inflation, it's important to note that inflation right now is not being driven by spending at all. It's being driven by these supply side issues that are caused by COVID. And what's at the root of those? In part. Policies. In the 90s, it's been so, it's been so many um, of our jobs overseas so that we have to import so much. There's no more storage capacity here in America because everyone has tried to cut the margin so slim so that CEOs can earn and so that shareholders can earn and can be paid dividends at the cost of the American worker. I don't, I don't disagree with that either. I, I don't disagree with that either. Yeah, shipping all our jobs over to China uh, has had American workers pay real costs on a number of fronts. It's funny. You know, we do like in no world could I vote for Bernie Sanders. I have to be honest. I don't think. Like, but I agree. Oh, yeah. Whenever I hear you talk, I'm like, I agree with what she's saying. When I hear Crystal talk, I'm like, I agree with that, too. But then, you know, w- sort of taken to its logical extreme. Some of these things I'm like, that's where I draw the line. But. I'm not a Republican and I'm not a Democrat, just like you either. I'm sort of like, who makes sense and who's reasonable? And I do see the country divor- dividing now into people who are rational and irrational, who make sense and who don't make sense. Then for sure, there is an elites versus regular people problem that needs to be completely busted open. And it, and it's it's manifest in my industry and in our, your industry more than any other, right? And when it comes to government politicians and journalists, they're the least trusted among us because they all have their own skin in the game and the consumer knows it. Yeah, I think that's why you're seeing the proliferation of podcasts, independent media, shows like Crystal Balls and Sagar and Jetties really taking off. You see people like yourselves who have had amazing careers in mainstream media finding platforms and a, and a huge audience on, on YouTube and these other places because folks are decoupling from the cable box. I don't know anybody Decoupling. in my generation, I'm 36 years old, who has cable, really. Yep. And we're yep. all just watching the, the clips on Twitter to the extent that Paul Bet- Begulis says something ridiculous. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it's partly because there's no, we're not reflected there. I remember at certain points during the campaign, certain folks who were um, pegged as the, you know, progressive spokesperson, the person who was going to speak for progressives on some of these mainstream news outlets, will call me and ask, hey, what, what do the progressives think about X, Y, and Z? What's, what's the line? Uh, and I would think, well, you could just ask me on. You could just ask what it is. The thousands of people who are out here writing articles for progressive outlets, independent news media, all of these people who have these podcasts and this whole infrastructure, you could just let them on your network, but that's not how it works. And many of us have been officially or unofficially blacklisted and the viewers notice the viewers notice that they're not reflected and they're looking elsewhere. <laughs> 